Hi guys, welcome back to my channel Miss Manic. Today I'm going to do the first of a series of videos entitled Test Tuesday. And in this series I will be uploading 10 MCQs weekly on key specialties within medicine. This series is aimed at medical students but it may also be of use to doctors or any health care care professional who simply wants to refresh their knowledge so if you like this video please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss any updates now i'm going to pause after each question but if you need some additional time to answer the questions feel free to pause the video yourself it's entirely up to you so let's get started the first question concerns a 20-year-old male who presents with abdominal pain, weight loss and diarrhea and these have been present for the last three months. Fecal calprotectin is raised and white cells are also raised and the supervising clinician suspects that he has Crohn's disease. Which of the following features is least consistent with Crohn's disease? So. The options are A. Clubbing, B. Crypt abscesses, C. Transmural inflammation, D. Skip lesions, or E. Strictures. So now I'm going to pause for about 10 to 15 seconds. So the answer is B, crypt abscesses. So this question concerns Crohn's disease, which is a really common exam question. And students often get confused about the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Crohn's disease is an inflammatory bowel disorder of unknown etiology and it can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus and this inflammation is not continuous and you get what we call skip lesions. So looking back at the question we see that the man is a 20 year old man and Crohn's disease actually has a bimodal distribution. This means it's more common in the 14 to 40 age group and the 60 to 80 age group. And it will typically present with abdominal pain, diarrhea and weight loss. So very like the presentation in this question. And one of the options, the first option was clubbing. Now clubbing is present in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So that was incorrect. Crypt abscesses are present in ulcerative colitis and transmural skip lesions and strictures are all features of Crohn's disease. Strictures are a well recognized complication of Crohn's disease. And as mentioned, cryptopsises are not a feature of Crohn's, but are more often seen in ulcerative colitis. So, moving on to question two. Question two concerns a 27-year-old male with ulcerative colitis who presents to ED with severe abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. He reports passing seven bloody motions in the last 24 hours. His observations are 99% oxygen saturation on room air, pulse 100, blood pressure 120 over 80, temperature 38.1, respiratory rate 16, and blood tests reveal a hemoglobin of 80 and an ESR of 42. So what is the best management option for this patient? So again, I will pause after the question. 
and to allow you time to answer. So A oral ASA, B oral penicillin, C IV cortical steroids, D IV cyclosporin, or E topical ASA. So the answer here is C, IV cortical steroids. Now, this is a difficult question, so don't worry if you have got it wrong on this occasion. So it, the question really concerns your knowledge of true love and wits criteria, which is a classification that is used for ulcerative colitis. So unlike Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis tends to give bloody diarrhea and true love and wits criteria divide or classify ulcerative colitis into mild, moderate or severe using six different criteria. We see that this patient has greater than six bowel motions. They have a temperature, tachycardia, anemic and also have a high ESR and all these features point towards a severe presentation of ulcerative colitis. So if we were to look in depth at the score we see that severe features include movements greater than six bowel mo motions in 24 hours, bleeding is large and severe exasperations, the patients are pyrexic, they have a pulse of a greater than 90 and are anemic and have an ESR of greater than 30. So normally patients with severe exasperation will have greater than six bowel movements and they will have one or more of the other features. So in inflammatory bowel disease, we must think of treatment in two forms, remission and maintenance. And because it's a relapse and remitting condition, patients will have flares. And in this case, we want to encourage remission. So it's inducing that remission rather than a maintenance drug therapy. And in severe ulcerative colitis, we achieve remission by giving IV cortical steroids. And if there's no improvement within 72 hours, we can give IV cyclosporin. If this patient had mild or moderate ulcerative colitis, we would encourage remission by giving oral or topical ASA. So moving on to the third question. And this concerns a 29-year-old lady who presents with weight loss, abdominal pain and foul smelling stools which are difficult to flush away and on her knees she has an intensely itchy rash. Her past medical history includes type 1 diabetes. Which of the following is the best investigation to perform? So we have A. Duodenal biopsy B. Continue gluten diet and then do IgA anti-TTG. C. Continue gluten diet and then do IgA anti-endomyocele. D. Stop gluten diet and do IgA anti-TTG. E. Stop gluten and do IgA anti-endomyocele antibody. So again, I'll give you some time to answer. So the correct answer is B, which is continue gluten diet and do IgA anti-TTG. So the patient in the question has celiac disease and this is an inflammatory anteropathy, anteropathy with gluten as its trigger.
So patients will tend to present with weight loss, abdominal pain and diarrhea. And this rash on the knees is dermatitis herpetiformis, which is an intensely itchy rich rash which is associated with the condition. And a biopsy, which is option A, of the duodenum would reveal that the villi in the intestines intestines have atrophied. But this is not an appropriate initial investigation. It's very invasive, so therefore A is not the correct answer. And it is this problem with the villi that leads to electrolyte abnormalities which are very common in celiac disease and they include hypocalcemia and hypokalemia and they can also be iron deficient celiac patients. So the best initial test to do is B which is the anti-TTG and Patients are encouraged to continue a gluten diet um, for six weeks prior to testing. So we want the patients to continue gluten and then test for this anti-TTG. It's not an effective test if the patients have stopped the gluten. So we want gluten to continue for the six weeks prior to the test. And the anti-endomyosal antibodies can be used for celiac disease, but they are second line test and the anti-TTG of first line. So next we have question four, which concerns a 32 year old woman who presents with non-bloody diarrhea and weight loss and colonoscopy has shown a cobblestone um, appearance and transmural inflammation and skip lesions. So what is the best drug for therapy for maintenance? So we have A, azithroprine, B, cyclosporin, C, prenicillin, D, methotrexate, or E, sulfosalazine. So the answer here is A, and this is just something that you'll have to learn. Um, I didn't pause there because it's, it's something you either know or you don't know. But the answer here is A, and the patient has presented with Crohn's disease, and we see this as they have non-bloody diarrhea and they also have transmural inflammation, skip lesions and cobblestone appearance on colonoscopy which is very in keeping with Crohn's disease and remember we talked about maintenance and remission or maintenance and inducing remission so for Crohn's the first line maintenance is in fact the drug mentioned in A. So we remember these as the AM drugs. So those two are listed on the screen and they are the maintenance drugs that we use in um, Crohn's disease. And now we're moving on to question five. So question five is a 35-year-old man who presents with three-month history of non-bloody diarrhea. He has abdominal pain and oral mouth ulcers. His fecal calprotectin was raised. He complains of red painful lumps on his legs. What is the likely underlying condition and skin manifestation? So the options here are A, celiac disease with dermatitis herpetiformis, B, celiac disease with erythema nodosum, 
C. Crohn's disease with dermatitis herpetiformis. D. Crohn's disease with erythema nodulosum. Nodosum, sorry. Or E. Crohn's disease with erythema multiforme. Again, I'll give you some time to answer this question. So the answer here is D, which is Crohn's disease um, and erythema nodosum. And the patient here is presenting with the classical signs of Crohn's disease, such as the non-bloody diarrhea and the mouth ulcers. And a raised faecal calprotectin suggests an inflammatory bowel disorder. And the red lumps on the legs are indicative of a condition known as erythema nodosum, which is very commonly seen in Crohn's disease. And dermatitis herpetiformis is associated with celiac disease, which we covered in an earlier question. And again, it's very important to know this because sometimes students get mixed up in these and examiners like to include them in their MCQ questions because they know that. So we're halfway there. We're on question six, which is a 53-year-old patient, inpatient, who has experienced profuse diarrhea and paraxia for the last three days. And this lady recently was treated for community-acquired pneumonia and has completed her course of antibiotics. Her white cells and CRP are markedly increased. So what treatment would you commence? So we have A, oral clindamycin, B, oral coamoxiclav, C, oral metronidazole, D, oral ciprofloxacin, or E, none as diarrhea in this condition is self-limiting so again I'm just going to pause to allow you to answer so the answer is C oil metronidazole and this patient has C. difficile, which is a gram-positive bacteria, and it lies dormant in many healthy patients. However, when a patient receives antibiotics, in this case, this patient has had antibiotics for community-acquired pneumonia, this can disrupt the natural balance of bacteria in our gut, and this can lead to C. difficile colitis. Now, some common antibiotics that can lead to C. difficile are clindamycin, coamoxiclav, and ciprofloxacin. And those are options A, B, and D. So those are, will be incorrect because they can lead to C. difficile rather than treat C. difficile, which is what the question is asking. So it's very important to read the question and the treatment of choice for C. difficile um, is oral metronidazole so we cannot simply leave this condition without treating um, as option E suggests as it has the potential to be very serious it can cause toxic megacolon and we do uh, abdominal x-ray to exclude this and it also has the potential to spread to other patients. So it's very important to enforce strict infection control policies in a patient with C. difficile. 
So number seven, a 22 year old gentleman presents with a four months his history of weight loss, abdominal pain and very bloody diarrhea. And on palpitation, there's some tenderness in his right lower quadrant. His vital signs are all within normal range, which is the best test for confirming diagnosis. So we have A, abdominal x-ray, B, colonoscopy, C, CTAP, D, faecal calprotectin, and E, no test required as it is a clinical diagnosis. So I'm just going to pause. So the correct answer here is B. Colonoscopy is the best test. Um, we are suspecting ulcerative colitis and we are likely to see crypt abscesses on a biopsy taken at colonoscopy. So some of you may have put faecal calprotectin, which is option D. And whilst that is a useful test, um, for identifying the presence of inflammatory bowel disease. It's not very good at differentiating between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So this question really highlights the importance of reading the question because yes, we do use faecal calprotectin as one of our investigations for ulcerative colitis, but you have been asked what is the best test for confirming diagnosis and in this case, it is colonoscopy. So, question eight. A 26-year-old gentleman with Crohn's disease presents with seven bloody motions in the past 24 hours. Which of the following features is in keeping with Bowel motions, in keeping with the bowel motions, would suggest a severe flare. So, this gentleman actually has ulcerative colitis. Um, sorry, I said Crohn's. He has ulcerative colitis and we want to know what feature, apart from the seven bloody bowel motions, would suggest a severe flare. So the options are A, CRP of 40, B, ESR of 33, C, hemoglobin of 120, D, pulse of 72, or E, a temperature of 37.2. Again, I'm going to give you some time to think about this one. So the answer here is B and it relates to an earlier question and answer which we covered on classifying ulcerative colitis using the true love and wits criteria. So for a severe um, a flare, a patient must have more than six motions and this patient has had seven bloody motions plus one of the following and that is a large amount of blood, ESR over 30, pulse over 90, hemoglobin under 10, and that's the old measurement, and paraxia over 37.8. So here, out of all those options, ESR over 33 is the only one that's in keeping with that criteria. And we have CRP of 40 which is option A and that is not used in the classification of mild, moderate and severe flares. So we're nearly finished, we're on number 9. So well done 
for all of those people who have stuck with the questions. Um, two more to go and then we will wrap up. So number nine, a 15 year old male has thousands of polyps detected within his colon on colonoscopy. His father also had this condition and required a prophylactic colectomy. What is the gene involved and the mode of inheritance? So the options here are A, autosomal dominant and APC gene, B, autosomal dominant and DNA mismatch repair gene mutations, C, autosomal recessive and APC gene, D, autosomal recessive and DNA mismatch repair gene mutations, or E, X-linked recessive and APC gene. So again, I'm just going to give you time to answer and pause. If you need to pause the video for longer, do so to allow you time to think. So the answer here is A. So this condition is familial adenomatous polyposis, which is quite a mouthful. Um, it's an inherited condition. And some of you who have got this question wrong may have mistaken it with HNPCC which is hereditary non polypopous colorectal cancer, which is another inherited autosomal dominant condition. So they're both autosomal dominant conditions. HNPCC is associated with the mismatch repair genes and FAP is associated with the APC gene. So that's just something you have to commit to memory and learn. And our last question, question 10, concerns a 62-year-old man, man who presents with changes in bowel habit, tenismus, weight loss and intense fatigue. His blood tests show that he is grossly anemic. What tumour marker is most likely to be raised? So we have A, AFP, B, CEA, C, CA199, D, CA125, or E, PSA. Again, I'm just going to allow you some time to think about that one. So the answer here is B, C, E, A. So we're thinking of colon cancer. Alpha fetoprotein in A is used for seminomas and liver tumours. C, E, A, which is the correct answer, is used for colon cancer. C, A, 199 is used in pancreatic cancer. CA125 is used for ovarian cancer and PSA is used in prostate cancer. So that is all the 10 MCQs for this week and I hope you join me again next week for another Test Tuesday on a different specialty. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more updates and if you have any questions about the content or simply want to say which questions you found hard or easier please leave a comment thank you very much for listening and please tune in again but for now bye